morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, moderators. Thank you, worship teams, for uh, leading us into this worship service. Uh, happy 2014 to all of you. I hope that the new year is off to a great start for each of you. And it's just so great to be back. You know, we've had a, a pretty long break of no youth service, so it's good to be here uh, worshiping with you all again. It looks like we're a little bit less than maybe normal, but I think and I hope that we still have a good time today. Um, so let's go ahead and start off in a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into the sermon. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for gathering us this morning to worship your name. We thank you that you give us voices to sing, you give us eyes to see, and ears to hear. And we pray that as we look into your word right now, we pray that you would speak to us, we pray that you would show us your truth, and that as a result of what we hear, as a result of what we see, we might come to worship you uh, better, we might come to understand you more clearly, and that, yeah, all of this would be just uh, such wonderful praise into your name. So would you bless our time right now, help us to uh, listen to you, help us to uh, know you more. We pray all this in Christ's name, amen. <coughs> what would you do with $10 million? Uh, I think, thinking to myself, if I had $10 million, say I won the lottery and I won $10 million, I would probably buy myself a house, uh, I would probably buy myself a car, uh, I would probably buy my parents a house and car as well, and maybe see if other family members uh, maybe had need, I would probably buy them a house and cars too. Uh, I think even for my own home, I would try and um, buy all the latest electronics, all the latest gear, and I would just make my house... Uh, very nice if I had $10 million. And I think a lot of you, uh, your imagination probably goes a little wild when you think, oh man, if I had $10 million, I would do this, I would do that. And we begin to thinking all of the different things that we might do if we all had that money. You know, we tend to think in our society, especially in our culture, you know, if I have enough money, then I could do this. You know, I could do this thing that I've always dreamed of. You know, I could travel the world, I could go backpacking through Europe, whatever it may be, we start thinking, I can do this and I can do that. If I just have this amount of money, if I just have this amount of money, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be able to be fulfilled and my life will be able to be complete. I can just rest and retire and it'll all be good. The book of Ecclesiastes has challenged us uh, each week, I hope, to think about where we find our value, and where we find our meaning in life. Some of the things that we have looked at in previous weeks is, is perhaps trying to find value in wisdom, trying to find value in, in being intelligent, in, in being smart, in knowing a lot of things. Another week, it, it is in pleasure, trying to get us things that help us to feel good. Or perhaps it's been in possession, trying to acquire different things, maybe even build certain things to make us feel like we're important, to make us feel like we have value. Or, or maybe it's even in just finding the right job, finding that occupation where we can pour our lives into, where we can find meaning, where we can find purpose in life. Now the preacher, uh, who I believe is uh, Solomon, he, he turns us to the topic, to the subject of money. Will money buy us happiness? Or will money buy us love? Or meaning? Or contentment in life? To quote a, a popular phrase from my childhood, Mo money, mo problems. And that's why I have entitled our sermon today, Mo money, mo problems. And uh, for those of you who are thinking, what, what is that? Is, is there a typo there? Is this supposed to say no money, no problems? Uh, what is it? Uh, for a translation for you guys, it really is more money, more problems, okay? So let's just let that be our understanding. I'm just borrowing a phrase from my childhood in the 90s uh, just to bring us back a little bit. Mo money, mo problems, all right? And the point is, uh, as we increase in our money, uh, you know, we think that, oh, yeah, things will get better. But really, the reality is, as we increase our money, as we increase our net worth and value, more problems are going to come. There's going to be more that we have to face. There's going to be more that we have to endure and experience. While money might provide us comfort, might provide us some relief, 
and even some form of happiness, really these feelings, these things are just temporary. With money comes a whole host of problems, which we are going to see from our text this morning. And what we have are really two big key problems with money at its source, money at its very root. And these two problems are the reality of oppression and the love of money. And we begin with the first, the reality of oppression. If you're kind of unclear what this word oppression might mean, it is unjust treatment or perhaps tyranny or persecution or maybe even simpler, it is using power to keep others down, using power to perhaps bring harm or to shut out others from other from things in life. And we see this in the first two verses, verses 8 and 9. I'll go ahead and read it again for us. It says, If you see oppression of the poor and denial of justice and righteousness in the province, do not be shocked at the sight. For one official watches over another official, and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. The language here is actually stronger than the English uh, may communicate. It is more than just a denial of uh, righteousness and justice, but it's actually a robbery of these very things. This is an active and deliberate decision to take something from someone else. Now, you don't go into a situation and you don't accidentally rob someone. You know, that, that just doesn't happen. If you're going to rob someone, you knowingly go in. Perhaps you take a weapon with you. You're going into that store because you have a purpose in mind. You, you want the cash from the register. You want uh, the, the valuable items behind the counter. You, you don't just accidentally go in and just try and rob someone because it's not going to work. A robbery is an active uh, decision to take something else. Now, Solomon's words here are, are a bit surprising, uh, at least to me. You, you might expect him to say, you know, if you see these things, if you see oppression, if you see a robbery of justice and righteousness, then it's time to begin. Take some action. Stop these things from happening. And, and that would make sense to me. I think that would make sense to us. But far from taking action, all Solomon says here, all the preacher says here is, don't be surprised. If, if you see these things happening, if you see the poor being mistreated, don't be surprised. How's that for a kingly response? If you see a crime in progress, let it go. It happens all the time. Oh, that, that, that's normal. Now, more than talking about being passive, I think... What the preacher here is getting at, what he's saying is, these things are happening. You shouldn't be surprised at these ha things happening because corruption is so widespread. What is pictured here is a hierarchy, is a, a, a totem pole of power, if you will, of these officials. Perhaps they're government leaders, perhaps they're bankers or presidents of organizations, and they are just watching out for one another's backs. They're watching over and trying to protect their very own investments. It's not about justice for them. It's not about doing what's right, but it's about selfish greed and selfish gain. The thought is, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Imagine if we were to all stand up and you know, do that massage line thing where you, you know, you're standing here and you massage other people's shoulders. Right? Imagine if I told you to do that and then we just did one way. Okay, everyone face this way and massage. Uh, the person in front of you, and I said, sit down. And now, a lot of you would be like, hey, hey, what, what about this way? we got to turn the other way. You know, someone's got to do me. And, and I think we kind of get that thinking. We, you know, you, you do me, and, and I'll do you next. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And this is what these officials are doing. There is an understanding that if I do something for you, you are going to be, do something for me, and that, only that will be right. And this is what's going on here. They always make that switch. But there is corruption that is running all over the place. The king here was supposed to help and protect the people. But this corruption was so great that oppression was going on. 
oppression continue to spread and go everywhere. Money fuels selfishness. Money fuels greed. When someone tries to get something from us that we don't want to give up, we slap their wrists. We say, mine, like those birds in Finding Nemo. Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> and we don't want to give anything up. We do whatever we can to hold on to what we think is ours, especially money, because we find it so dear. We find it so important to our daily functions. But this morning, we have to ask ourselves, how are you serving the poor? How am I serving the poor? How am I serving those that are oppressed, perhaps in our schools, perhaps even in our very homes? Are you helping in some way? Or are you part of the problem? Are you part of the corruption? Are you part of the groups that bring and keep others down, that keep them feeling depressed, that keep them feeling discouraged, that keep them feeling lonely and like they have no one else in this world? Are you part of that problem? Money can make us do some very terrible things. Uh, Black Friday wasn't too long ago, and you hear stories about Black Friday where people get trampled to death. It's crazy. You know, what people will do to save a couple of bucks just to get that, you know, door buster item. You know, people will push each other, they'll shove each other, they'll step on each other and not even help someone else up to the point where someone dies in that situation. And that is a shame. And that is ridiculous. And that is a result of a greed and a want for money and for things. People get hurt and people literally, they get trampled. Oppression is very real. You just turn on the TV, you just turn on the news, and you see it everywhere. And it comes because of this second problem, the love of money, the love of money. And particularly what we want to see in this love of money is that this love is misplaced. And we also want to see what problems come and what problems result as a result of this love for money. And the first thing that we see is in verse 10 of Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and that is uh, the love of money. It doesn't satisfy. It does not satisfy. Look at verse 10. It says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with his income. This too is vanity. Uh, there's no hidden meaning here. It's not hard to understand. If you love money, you will never be fully satisfied by it. And why is this the case? Because if money is all you want, then this is a never-ending task. Money and sin in general always leads us to wanting more and more and more. Solomon here, he is so emphatic that he already breaks into a conclusion. And he yells out, vanity soap bubbles, all of this is meaningless, all of this is going to go away, all of this is not worth your time. It is all meaningless. It is all vanity. Money does not satisfy. And secondly, money, it attracts dependence. It attracts dependence. Can we uh, move two slides ahead? One more. There you go. Money attracts dependence. Look at verse 11. It says, when good things increase... Those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? As money goes up, so does the attention upon you. And I'll say if your mom, if you knew your mom in the household controlled all the money, right? And that probably happens in a lot of households. You wouldn't go to your dad and say, hey dad, I need all this money. You go to the person that has the money. You would go to your mom and ask your mom for that money. And that's what happens, <clears throat> as money goes up, so does the attention upon you. Now, there was a, a, a well-known football player um, who, you know, football players, sports athletes, they make a lot of money. And this particular athlete, uh, he's recent, and, you know, I just won't use his name because it doesn't matter. But uh, he was in line for a big contract. You know, he was playing very well, and he was going to get a big contract. I don't remember <coughs> the exact amount. <coughs> But I think the amount was something like he was going to get $30 million for, I don't know how many years, maybe a few years. Three, let's just say three years, $30 million. 
And for me, and I think for all of us, we, you know, if someone's going to offer us three, three, $30 million for three years of doing whatever, we're going to take it because that's $30 million. But for him, he felt dissed by this offer. And he came back, and there was a quote, and I'm sure part of it was out of context in some sense, but he was like, he, he declined because he's, he said, I got to feed my family. $30 million, and he comes back and says, I got to feed my family. Now you hear that, and it's like, what are you, what are you eating? $30 million, you don't need that much money. But, but think about it. You know, think about, think about this situation. Before we say how ridiculous it is, and it is, uh, we have to understand that his family is more than just his immediate family. It's probably, you know, his wife and kids. Uh, it's probably his uncles and aunties. It's his nieces and nephews. It's these family friends that are part of his family. It's random friends. It's his agent. It's his agent's family. And all these people are a part of his family, a part of his entourage now. And that begins to add up. If you're starting to take care of, you know, three people, you know, that's, you know, that's manageable. But then say you're starting to take care of like 50 people and they're a part of your family. You know, you start needing... Uh, perhaps, to, to need more money to take care of all of them. And this makes the point. As your net value increases, so do the hands that come out and say, hey, remember me? Remember me? We used to be in high school together. You know, we took the same chemistry class. Remember me? We were in the same dorm together. We were, remember, I was just down the hall, right across the, right across the hall. Can I have some money? <laughs> and this is what begins to happen. All these people are coming out of who knows where I'm just saying, hey, you remember me? C can you help me out? Can, can you pass me uh, a little bit of money? And all of a sudden, this money begins to run itself, and, and it's only able to be looked upon and admired from afar. Money also not only attracts dependence, but thirdly, it disturbs the peace. Look at verse 12. The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. There is satisfaction in work because you earn it. You, you work hard for it, and it's enjoyable in that sense because you know how hard it was to, to get that food, to get that money. But for the rich, there is no sleep. They have no peace. You know, have you ever been so full that you, you couldn't sleep? You ate so much that you just felt so disgusting that you couldn't do anything? Uh, that happened to me. Uh, I went to um, you know Vegas one day, just so it was a one day trip because we went to watch uh, Team USA basketball, and I don't know we were crazy and we ate two buffets in the same day. We ate a lunch buffet, and then we went to watch the game, and then we're like, hey, let's go to the uh, Wynn Hotel because that's where we knew some of the players were staying because we're like, oh, let me see some of the players, and we ate the Wynn buffet, and then we drove home. <laughs> but I was so full and I felt so disgusting that even on the drive back, I didn't drive. I couldn't even sleep because I felt so, so horrible. And, and, you know, we think that this food is going to satisfy, but it just leaves us tossing and turning at night. Riches, you know, it leaves us without peace. It, it leaves us feeling sick, and it leaves us feeling restless. You know, you just think about trying to get more money at night. You're thinking, man, if I do this, then I'll be able to double what I have. Or, or you begin to think the opposite. And, and you're so scared and you're so fearful of losing everything. And this is a terrible and a continuous cycle that keeps going on and on and on. And lastly here, money, it is finite. Money is finite. Look at verses 13 to 17. It says, There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Exactly as a man is born, thus he will die. So what is the advantage to him who toils for the wind? Throughout his life, he also eats in darkness with great vexation, sickness, and anger. This is perhaps the most devastating reason why money cannot fulfill us in life. What is described here is someone who is hoarding or guarding his own money. And you can imagine if you had to protect something, how much uh, uncertainty, how much paranoia that might cause. You know, I'm sure all of you have played the game, 
capture the flag before. And, and I've played before, you know, capture the flag maybe at night, and, and I've been tasked with protecting this flag. And sometimes when you're just sitting on this flag and you have no one around, you know, you kind of get startled at every noise that might come your way because you're thinking, oh man, they might be coming over here, they might be coming from here, what am I going to do? I don't want to, I don't want to be the one that, that is responsible for causing us to lose this game and letting the flag go. And you just sit there and you're just staring and you're just so paranoid because you're trying to protect your investment. You're trying to protect what's yours. And this is an unpleasant lifestyle and this is what happens when money begins to run your life. And to add, add even more problems, this vast wealth, just as uh, easily as it may be gained, it's so easily lost. The wording here is left vague as to let this imagination run wild in terms of what this bad investment may be. It might be putting all your money into uh, a stock tip that you might have. It might be gambling it all away in a card game or, 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 or whatever it may be. This money might be stolen away somehow. You trust someone to hold your money and it gets stolen. Or perhaps like in the account of Job, all of your riches are rid of in a great uh, act of nature. And there's many ways that we can lose our money. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways that it can all go just like that. And it gets more terrible for this man because this man has a son. He has a son, but he has nothing to give his son. He has nothing to show his son. As he came into this world with nothing, so he leaves. And that is the same with us. When you're born, you don't come in holding a bar of gold. You come in holding nothing. You come in crying into this world with nothing in hand. And that is the same way that you are going to leave. This chase for money is described as toiling for the wind or chasing after the wind. Now very quickly, I want you to do something. Take your right hand and try and catch the wind. Okay, ready? Go. Okay, did anyone get anything? No. There is nothing in your hand. You try and catch the wind. In whatever way you do, maybe even I, I gave you a jar and you try and catch the wind and you seal it up, what do you get? What do you see? Nothing. You're not able to do anything. You're just left with nothing in hand, just like you were born. And what a hopeless cause this is if money is all you desire. It's like trying to catch the wind. And it will leave you in darkness, a living death, with great worry over life's cares. It will leave you sick and emotionally distressed. Mo money, mo problems indeed. If money is not the answer, then what is? Look at our last verses very quickly. Verses 18 to 20. There is one solution, and that is finding joy in God. It says, here is what I have seen to be good and fitting to eat. To drink and to do enjoy oneself in all one's labors in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he has also empowered him to eat from them and to receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. The previous verses, they looked in the wrong direction, but these verses look brightly towards God. The mood changes, and there is great hope as God finally enters into the picture. What is good? What is fitting? What is beautiful? It's to enjoy the gifts that God so generously gives to us, eating and drinking and seeing, tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. You see, money isn't the problem in and of itself, but abusing it and forgetting where and who it comes from, that is the problem. If God is not your ultimate joy, then nothing else will ever satisfy you. What is the greatest joy of heaven? It's not eternal life. It's not streets of gold. It's not uh, no pain, no suffering, no death through health. But the greatest joy of heaven is God himself. Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 3, that's the next slide, is he said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, 
whom you have sent. That's it right there. In God, the problems of life soon become small because His grace becomes so big, so overflowing in our lives. You all here, we can all here rejoice and have gladness and satisfaction of heart because of what Christ has done. As Hebrews chapter 12, 2 tells us, For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. Finished. Complete. Oh, the joy that overshadows all vanity. That is in Jesus Christ alone. He provides for us an opportunity to experience joy, lasting joy that cannot be robbed, and that is only in the Lord God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you have given to us in your word, and we pray that though the world tells us just so many things, the world tells us that we need this amount of money and that amount of money to be happy, God. We pray that you would help us to find our joy, not in the things of this world, not in the money of this world, but help us to find our joy and satisfaction in you alone. May you help us to seek the things that are above, not the things that are below on this earth. So Lord, help us turn our eyes to you. Help us to have a great desire for you and the things which are pleasing and honoring to you. So Lord, thank you for this time. We ask for your blessings upon the rest of this service, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.